Hey everyone, welcome to week 34, day three. This is Wednesday. This is our ongoing shadow and light week. Uh, we've done Danny's portrait, uh, which was an afternoon sun. It was beautiful orange red light that was actually bouncing off the uh, window to the uh, left of me right now, uh, which is pretty incredible. And we did yesterday a painting of Fer lying down with a bunch of sunlight just kind of streaming in and her face being kind of uh, cut by this shadow, this like very subtle shadow mass. So it was a very beautiful, very different sense of shadow from the first day. And today we're gonna kind of keep that going and we're gonna see if we can redefine uh, shadow in another way. So let's see how we do. Okay, let's get started. Now for today, remember this is day three of our ongoing shadow and light week. And we are calling it that, we are calling it shadow and light and not light and shadow. Not because we want to rob light from the attention that it rightfully deserves. We are obviously acknowledging that if it wasn't for light, we wouldn't be able to paint. All of us painters that were educated in a sort of naturalist tradition, we obviously acknowledge and respect and celebrate the role that light plays in our painting. There wouldn't be any painting if it wasn't for light. It's as simple as that. It's the most precious of natural conditions and it's the one thing that we depend on. Not all of painting obviously depends on the uh, stimulus of light, but again, for all of us that work from a tradition that stems from just observing nature, we are inevitably bound to light. We are always going to be painting light and it's obvious that it holds an enormous amount of importance and relevance to our painting practice. So what we're trying to do by putting shadow in front of light is saying, hey, there are things that are happening in shadow that are obviously caused by light. The idea of shadow is inherently tied to the very nature of light. But there are things that are happening within shadow with the way shadow is being presented to us that are also super, super exciting. So when we say that we are going to be focusing on shadow, it doesn't mean that we have to paint super dark paintings. It's important that we go past this idea of thinking that shadow is something that we can solely equate to a darker mass. There's a lot of people that still think of shadows as dark, shadows as black even, which is very, very strange. And we broaden that conversation and we realize that a mass that can actually serve as a shadow mass can be super open and can have beautiful colors and a ton of hues in them and saturation and it can be as rich and sometimes even more so than the light mass. We started this week by doing a painting of Danny where we were examining the differences between the way shadow was being presented to us. So we had the obvious one, which is the shadow mass, which speaks about form turning away from the light source. And we also saw examples of projected shadows, cast shadows. So we saw the uh, shadow that the nose was casting onto the left side of the face, Danny's right. And we were also seeing the shadow that was being cast by the rim of her glasses. And we kind of tried to follow that trajectory, understanding that that very trajectory, the drawing of that shadow was actually speaking about the underlying form. So it was very, very exciting to try to see the differences in those two shadows and how the nature of them can actually speak about two things that have quite different qualities. So even though the painting from Monday feels like it comes from an artificial light source, it actually wasn't. It was a, a very beautiful moment in the afternoon. I think I've told you guys, and we spoke about this in a video that we did uh, weeks ago, but our apartment has windows that face east. So in the mornings, we get direct sunlight. As soon as the uh, sun comes up above the Andean mountains, uh, we get that beautiful, nice, you know, warm yellow direct sunlight from the morning. That usually happens like around 7.30 in the morning and it lasts till maybe, I don't know, nine maybe. Um, but in the afternoon, what we get is the uh, sun setting uh, around, you know, right before six o'clock in the afternoon. And while the sun is setting, we get this really beautiful orange red light. And this is 
almost random. This doesn't happen like every single day. Like it has to be in the perfect month and the perfect conditions for us to see this. But we get all that orange red light just bouncing off of the buildings that are right in front of us. And that light just then filters into our apartment. So if you think about it, it's pretty amazing. It actually speaks about the strength of this light, which is incredible because it's hitting the buildings and then bouncing off to us and filling up our apartment with this gorgeous, gorgeous ambient light that is very warm, very moody, very orange red. I mean, it's pretty incredible. So a couple of days ago, Danny was pointing out that, you know, we were getting that light in the afternoon and uh, she looked at me and, and she had her glasses on and I was like, oh my God, that light is incredible. I have to take a picture. Now, what's very cool about this light is that it has such deep atmosphere to it. It has such rich kind of mood and ambience to it that while there is no information within those shadows, we can't really get into that shadow mass and just try to search for changes in value or changes in hue. If there is, there may be a tiny, tiny bit of reflected light, but that's about it. What we are getting though is this color, this temperature that is just enveloping everything. So everything is going to be orange, red, everything. Light is going to be tinted with that warm reddish hue and shadow is actually going to be affected the same way. It's going to hold that temperature also. So we have a lighting condition that is warm warm. So this is one of those moments where we understand that those formulas that sometimes we read about that you know lights are cool and shadows are warm or lights are warm and shadows are cool and those are the only two conditions that can be presented to us in nature. This is actually teaching us that you know, warm light and warm shadow can be produced in a natural condition. And the reason being that this is a indirect lighting that is just flooding the atmosphere. So it's affecting everything in its path, absolutely everything. So it's actually really beautiful to understand that unity in hue and temperature. Now for yesterday's painting, something quite different happened because instead of having this indirect lighting, what we were having is this natural beam of sunlight just barreling through. And it was almost this uh, geometric shape of sunlight. It's this rectangle of sunlight that is just flowing through every single form that is in its path. One particular thing that I loved about yesterday was the fact that there are very different ways in which the shadow mass and the light mass meet and they create these very different edges throughout the atmosphere. So there are places where there's going to be a very sharp outline and we can differentiate shadow mass from light mass very, very easily. And there's also gonna be places where light has to travel through a form that is far more complex than just regular plane, like a wall or like a bed. By forms being more complex, I mean, in this case, fer. Light is going to have to travel through her and it's going to have to travel through all those little breaks of planes and form. And it's going to have to describe in that traveling you know, in that trajectory is going to have to describe what is happening in terms of Fer's structure. It's actually pretty amazing how that journey that that light takes is actually able to uh, speak so much about all the intricacies of Fer's form. So we have to be incredibly respectful of the manner in which uh, light is traveling through form. But what we're also getting with this light source that's incredibly powerful and it's incredibly strong is the fact that because it is so strong, it is actually bouncing off everything in that little room. And it's actually filling up that shadow with tons of information. And that information is being presented to us as painters as these gorgeous changes in hues and value and saturation. And it is so rich that it actually rivals everything that is happening in the light mass. I was actually far more excited to paint the shadow mass than the light mass. In the light mass, I saw just this unity. I, I knew that I had to convey this flow of light, this light as unity. But in the shadow mass, I was like, oh my God, it's breaking into so many colors. I can see cool violets and I can see cool reds and I can see cool greens and I can see cool oranges. I mean, it's almost overwhelming. And I think at some point, I was a little overwhelmed when I was painting it. I was a little like in over my head because I wanted to keep that sense of unity. And when I was blocking in the painting, I realized, yeah, I can actually hold on to the idea of, of there being unity in light, simplicity in light. 
but I can't really find economy, a way to represent in a very synthetic way what's happening in the shadow. And I ended up breaking that shadow into a ton of little strokes, into a ton of little colors that I think at some point I was like, oh my God, this is breaking up. I'm losing my drawing. I'm losing like the really nice sensitive gesture, you know, that kind of serpentine gesture that Fed was um, was taking. I'm losing it. I'm losing it. I was able to hold on to it in the way I locked in the hands. But in her portrait, which I wanted to be the focus of the painting, I was losing it completely. And I had to take my uh, my liner brush and I was like, OK, I got to find my drawing again. I, I have to give myself a chance to to find my way through this painting because you know, it's one of those points in a painting where you're like, I lost it. I lost it. And I don't think I can find my way back again. It's it's just too weird and too messy and it's too broken up. And oof, at that moment, I know that we become super, super desperate. I mean, we really feel super anxious. And all I can say is that when those moments come, I feel desperate too. I wanted to quit and stop the painting. And I was like, I'm done. I'm done with this. I don't like this painting anymore. I don't think it's going to work. Deep breath, which doesn't work. You know, forget it. When we are at that point, when we are losing it, we're like, F this. You know, you just want to throw the painting, tear the painting. It's like, I'm done. This is too difficult. But I was like, deep breath. Just do the things that you know are going to help you find your way which is just concentrate on drawing, concentrate on finding little clues that give you a sense of what that structure is. Now, oof, here's the part where I wish I was more sensitive because I have like butcher hands. I've always said my hands weigh a million tons. I mean, when I was painting that painting of Fed, they felt like I couldn't even move them. I can't lift my hands. So I wish I had lighter hands. I wish I had a lighter touch. I wish I had like a far more sensitive drawing. Those are the times where I'm like, oh, Jeremy Lipkin, curse you. You always know how to paint like the beautiful side of human beings. And I'm like, I don't have none of that. <laughs> I am not blessed with that. So there was a point where I was just doing this um, portrait of Fed which was so weird because light was actually throwing me in trying to understand this painting in one direction, but I was completely immersed in shadow. I was just drowning in that shadow mass. I saw so much information. There was so much going on in there that I was completely lost. And even though I was putting like drawing marks to try to find my way back again, at some point I was like, no, nah, forget this. I, I just can't do this. And what I ended up doing was just saying, okay, calm down. Just compare everything. Start comparing your values. Start comparing your hues. If you feel something has to be a little bit lighter, just try to find that shape, that color that you're looking for. Try to find that right value. Put it down and then keep moving. Try to construct good relationships that you can base your future decisions on. And just trust the fact that if you're constructing something based on a couple of good decisions, then that is going to add up in the end into you know, a pile of good decisions that is finally going to take you on your way. And that's kind of what happened. I mean, I felt I struggled through the painting. I really don't feel it was an easy painting to paint. But by the end, I saw it and I was like, I don't know, there's something weird about this painting. There's something incredibly attractive uh, about this painting because it's unsettling in a way. Because I think it spoke about the struggle. And I saw it and I was like, it's actually giving me Kathy Colvitz vibes. And Kathy Colvitz was, I mean, what can you say about her? She is one of the most impressive, amazing artists ever. I was going to say 20th century, but come on, ever. It is, it is going to be very hard to find an artist that is able to impregnate anything that she would do with so much soul. It's like those, um, you know, sculptures, etchings, drawings. I mean, anything she would touch, anything she would do, it's just imbued with life. And not only with life, but just this, this being, this human being that felt, felt suffering and felt pain. You could see the sense of those feelings weighing like a ton of bricks in that body. I mean, almost like my hands, but, <laughs> but you can sense that. And I've always said this, like, where is that? Where is that? You look at Colvitz and you're like, where is that? Like, ugh, I wish I could understand like where it is so I could tap into it and I can just, you know, learn from it. But you know, it's one of those things that we just can't grasp and we don't know where it resides. We don't know. It's just, that was just the way she could um, unravel things. That was just 
the way she understood her own sensibility and how she saw that in other people. It's amazing. Bear with me. I'm not saying I was able to do something like Katie Kolvitz. That's insane. You know, no. <laughs> but it gave me vibes. It gave me some of those vibes that I was like, I was trying to search for something in the light. And what I found was like a deeper truth within the shadow mass that was so, so rich that it almost didn't let me paint this beautiful painting, this beautiful, soft, sensitive painting that I wanted to paint of Fer, but instead it drove me into like a completely different direction. And I think the painting benefited for it. I mean, it was a weird painting. I didn't know what to make of it. When I was done with it, I was like, was this good? Was this not cool? Was this what I wanted? Is this just me, you know, being content with something that was different from, you know, what I originally had set out to do? Or is there something special there? And after a few days, when I look back upon that painting, I'm like, no, I think there's something really kind of cool and special with this painting, even though it is just about suffering. It is just about, ugh, you know, really, really finding your way through a painting. Now, why am I speaking so much about the suffering through a painting? Well, because today I actually had to do the same thing and uh, woof, it, it was tough. It was very, very tough because I was trying to focus in on the character of those long cast shadows, you know, deep eye sockets and that long cast shadow of the nose that actually trickles down through the upper lip, down the lower lip, and it actually continues almost to the uh, chin, which is actually quite fascinating. And that cast shadow that drops from the uh, cheekbones. And it actually immerses uh, a lot of that mandible, a lot of that jaw into shadow. And it connects it with the uh, neck. The neck is actually completely part of the uh, shadow mass. I love how shadow kind of interlocks all those uh, pieces of that structure. But I was frustrated. And, and I think while it wasn't the same feeling I had of Fer, I'm painting my niece, Cristina, and you know, she's 17 right now, and because my hands are so damn heavy, I mean, ugh, yesterday and today were a reminder of, of really how I have to work really hard to get, you know, my drawing to be a little more sensitive, because whenever I want to invoke that more sensible part of my drawing, oh my god, there's nothing there, I'm running on fumes, and when I saw what I was painting, I was like, I think this is her. I think this is my niece. You know, she is in there, but she's trapped in this older body. You know, you can tell that, you know, this is my future niece. This is what my niece is going to look like someday. <laughs> and I'm not saying like I'm an oracle. I'm not saying this is, you know, painting as a way to see the future. I feel that my hands are so heavy and I want to put so much character and sentiment into what I paint that I end up drenching my subject matter a little more than what I wish I would. And I think I got frustrated. So I had to let uh, some of that paint dry. Remember, I'm painting on raw paper, so that's a little bit easier for me to do. And I was like, no, I got to find my way again. So I took my liner brush and I was like, okay, let's find my drawing back again. Let's um, restructure all these like shadow masses and all these uh, cast shadows that are incredible. And let's try to see if I can tap into Christina's current essence, not her future essence. And I was able to get some of that, but I don't know. I think it's like a curse with me. I'm not able to see the fluffy, the beautiful part, the quote unquote beautiful, because for me, the way I see people is absolutely beautiful. I'm not able to see this classical beauty in people. What I'm able to see is like this raw quality in people. And I find that incredibly appealing because that to me is essentially what makes us human beings. So I'm immediately drawn to that. And because I'm drawn to it, I'm for sure going to emphasize it. So... Oof, this is kind of like a reminder that I'm never going to be a painter that I can't be, you know, that I always have to come to terms with the painter that I am and with the sensibility that I do have and with the way I actually see things. And I had to fight for those things like yesterday and today. And I think in very different ways, they are examples of the type of painting that I can make. And I was very grateful because due to the uh, focus that I'm having on this week, you know, just really kind of diving into shadows, I'm actually focusing in on different aspects of my painting. And perhaps that's actually even 
you know, affecting my painting in a way. And I find that super, super interesting. But anyways, so I think that if you add up yesterday's painting, that was a real struggle. And today's painting, that was very frustrating because I had to, you know, actually put it aside for some days and then paint on top of it and, and see if I could restructure the uh, painting. Ah. <sighs> You know, some days, you know, it's not easy and we have to hack and slash our way through it and we have to rely on fundamentals to help us find our way. And even then, even if we give it our best shot, the result can be disconcerting. We really don't know what to make of the resulting paintings. And I think that that happened to me both yesterday and today. Um, again, very different feelings because one is Fer and one is Cristina. They're obviously both my family. I obviously love them very dearly. But, you know, they were throwing me into very different directions, but that at the end, they meet in a place where I just have to come to terms with myself and I just have to accept myself and say, well, apparently, you know, this is the painter that I am. <laughs> so, so I just have to quietly accept this and then just really cherish it in a way and say, yeah, I'm just going to work within the variables that make me the painter that I am. So very nice reminder. And it was super nice that I found those answers in shadows. So, you know, a weird thing, but amazing things can happen when we focus in on uh, very particular things for these uh, weekly exercises. So that was it for today. Um, I hope you guys liked it. I suffered through it. So <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed my suffering. I'll see you guys tomorrow where I'm going to go back to my fountain. I was inspired by that, you know, beam of light that I saw uh, with Fede's painting yesterday. And I told myself, I'm gonna do this one thing that I love to paint about myself and I thoroughly enjoy it. So I invite you guys to uh, check that out tomorrow where we will have another adventure uh, in shadows and hopefully, you know, wandering through those shadow masses, um, I'm going to um, learn a very valuable lesson like I did today. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you, bye.